It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. If you surveyed Americans asking them to identify themselves as A, Catholic, B, Muslim, C, Evangelical, and so on, an increasing number will select the very last option, none of the above. Study after study has shown a steady decline in religious affiliation, with one in five Americans identifying as none. Traditional religious believers watch these numbers with a bit of uneasiness, wondering why fewer people are connecting with institutional religion. In this episode, Elizabeth Drescher joins us to talk about her new book on this subject, Choosing Our Religion, The Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns. Drescher surveyed thousands and directly interviewed around 100 nuns to find out about their backgrounds, their hopes, morals, and spiritual sensibilities. Her work allows us to become more familiar with some nuns in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Send questions or comments about this and other episodes to mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to rate and review us in iTunes. Elizabeth Drescher. She's an adjunct associate professor of religious studies at Santa Clara University. And today she's speaking with us about her new book, Choosing Our Religion, The Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns. Do you mind if I call you Elizabeth? Not at all. Okay. Well, welcome to the show, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. So in 2012, the Pew Research Center released this report called Nuns on the Rise. It got a lot of play in the media, and it, it proffered that more and more Americans aren't claiming any religious affiliation. So if they had a list of, are you Catholic, are you Protestant, uh, none of the above would be the answer. Nuns, not nuns, N-U-N-S, like (laughs) Catholic nuns, but nuns. Now the numbers had increased in 2012 to about 20% of Americans. That's one in five. What sort of claims do you remember seeing in the news when this report came out? Well, you know, that that report was, was really big because it was timed to coincide with the presidential election. So it came out in October, the election was in November, of course, and it presaged this increase in people who are religiously unaffiliated and politically liberal, generally skewing more liberal, and you know they were identified as a big voting bloc for President Obama in that election. And that immediately set off this frenzy around, first of all, understanding who these people were, and then understanding how they how they vote and how they could be mobilized for voting. And that became a bit of a big challenge. I mean, in January after the election, a group of secular humanists and atheists and other organizations were people who might identify as none, although not always, um, tried to, uh, had a conference to try to, to develop nuns as a constituency, but of course that's sort of the point. Nuns are none, right? <laughs> their their nunness is sort of their ontological spiritual identity, right? It's it's who they are. In fact, just the other day I, I wrote a piece for HuffPo and uh, on nuns and sort of the evolutionary re- roots of religion possibly, and a nun commented, stop trying to figure us out, you know, we're (laughs) nuns, like that's our thing, we're nuns, leave us alone. So the news that first came out, uh, actually it was in 2008 that Nuns in the Rise came out, or sorry, the first Nuns report came out, and then 2012 Nuns in the Rise came out after the election, was just all this trying to categorize a cohort that by definition doesn't want to be categorized. It's really interesting, too, because then you start to have to get into specifics about demographics, right? So what the numbers show, even though this category itself is being imposed upon a group of people, is that to a greater uh, degree, youth uh, are nuns, but but numerically, strictly numerically, more people over 40 are nuns. And there's this really funny line in here (laughs) where you say, uh, why? Because numbers. Uh, which is really, I thought that was really funny. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, so the the Pew data, and this has gone up even a little bit since then. So in 2012, 20% of the adult population identified as religiously unaffiliated. By last year, um, the number was up to 23%. And among people under age 30, it was 30% in the 2012 study. Um, it gone up to about 32%. 
by last year. So it's ticking up, you know, and that under 30 group, of course, throws religious organizations and lots of religious folks into a panic. You know, the, the kids are slipping away. What are we going to do? And they're not coming back. That's another big thing that Pew found is that they're, they're not going to wait till they have kids and then come back. It's not like in the 70s and the 80s. So that's certainly true. That's a thing. Um, and as a trend, it's not insignificant. But the thing that I think people tend to forget or not pay attention to as all that's happening is that just because there are more people in the population who are over the age of 30, it means that mathematically the larger population of the unaffiliated is over age 30. And, and so in the book, I really wanted to move beyond, you know, this sort of way, you know, I talk about in the book, this sort of, you know, stereotypical nun as this, you know, hipster dude in some latte slinging corridor of the yeah. United States, generally on the coasts, you know, so in, you know, Brooklyn or Adams Morgan, or Portland, San, <laughs> yeah, Portland, San Francisco, in the, in the Silicon Valley where I live, you know, hanging out, that's happening, that's certainly a thing. But I think I also saw among the people that I interviewed across the country, you know, the Pew data says everywhere in the country, in every sector in the, in the country, every geographical region and every sector demographically, unaffiliation is rising. So yeah, the Deep South is still more religious than the rest of the country, but unaffiliation is actually increasing at a faster rate there. And um, yes, among young, uh, among young people, unaffiliation is increasing at a, a rapid clip, but among people over 30, it is as well. So uh, we don't get a complete picture when we just look for, you know, dudes in skinny jeans with a goatee and, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> so, um, so I try to look a little more broad spectrum than that. And there's a part where you say if, if all the nuns were grouped together in one group, that they would be bigger than any Protestant denomination numerically, right? All of the mainline, yeah, bigger than all of the mainline denominations combined. And so they'd be a huge denomination. You know, there's lots of energy around what does this mean? The, the focus my research has tended to take is not to ask the question, uh, well, how do we find one definitive pattern of belief and practice that we say is, is characteristic or stereotypical of the nuns, or to say, how do we identify them as a social or market cohort so that they can be either mobilized for political action or captured, as religious people like to say. Somebody just said to me last week, well, how do you lure them in? <laughs> and I said, wow, that sounds just like incredibly compelling, <laughs> um, you know, as a strategy for engaging human beings. Well, but, you note that there um, are some books that do that, right? That approach nuns oh, in terms of, you know, how do we get nuns back to church? Yeah, right. They're, and they sort of vacillate between the sort of shame-based, what's wrong with us? Why don't they like us? What did we do wrong? <laughs> And the how do we get them, how do we get them to come back, you know, which gets to somewhere in that story, there's a van without windows, you know, uh, <laughs> and it just gets a little creepy. So people are looking, have looked at that. I was really interested in what are nuns telling us about what religion and spirituality mean and how they function, what they, what they are and what they do in contemporary culture, because I think for me, that's a thing that you can say with some confidence that whatever else nuns might be doing socially and politically and however else they might be engaged by religious communities or not, it is certainly true that they're marking a different understanding of what it means to be religious and spiritual, and that's not insignificant. Yeah, that's what I found most compelling about the book, actually. And, and I actually see it as almost... <laughs> I hate to use the word apologetic because it's it's so loaded and in, in, when I'm using it in terms of, especially in terms of this kind of scholarship, but it's sort of trying to debunk some of the myths about nuns. And it's also doing a different project with regard to nuns than a lot of the other books. And uh, I, I found that really interesting. And this is, I think, where religious people could, could still very much benefit from this book is to learn about 
uh, the surprising spiritual or even religious uh, lives of some of these nuns that you speak with in the book. Yeah, I mean, I that was actually a learning process for me as I was doing the research. Uh, I mean, I personally am a you know religionish person, you know, by denomination. I'm Episcopalian. I don't know a real good one, but you know, <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, that's that's where I identify ish. And as I but doesn't started, that make you a good Episcopalian? Like that sort yes, of. Yes, I think so. I think so. I think that makes me very orthodox um, in that tradition. But so I, you know, I started the project having had you know a long, deep, complex, and fraught um, relationship with my own tradition, and I actually was teaching at a, an Episcopal seminary when I first started the research on nuns back in 2008 when the first big Pew study came out and the American Religious Landscape study that said, wow, there's a big jump since the 1990s in uh, the number of unaffiliated. And, you know, I was really, of course, interested in that because that was when, because of the economic downturn and other kinds of pressure, seminaries everywhere were just really, really struggling, and it's not like it was new that people weren't entering seminary or fewer people were going to church or all of those kinds of things, but it was big in a new way in 2008 because of all kinds of different things going on, and yet when, you know, when I would talk about, like, this is a thing, we ought to pay attention to, you know, the way I think a lot of church leaders I saw responded to it as like, ah, they'll come back in 10 years. They'll have kids and then yeah. they'll pop back in. It'll be okay. We've been through this before. But it wasn't like that. It wasn't anything like that. And as I started talking with nuns I knew in my, in my own life, in the community or around me, you know, I realized it was hard for me to not take a Christianish apologetic perspective. So when I was first doing interviews, I get that. What's wrong with us? You could go to a different church. Like, yeah, there, you know, there's other options. You know, you can do it differently. And I had to really discipline myself to be a listener, to really, I mean, not just as an academic ethnographic interviewer, that's certainly an important skill set, but to really in my own head be not wanting to fix the Christian tradition or fix religion for the people I was talking to, but to really absorb what they were experiencing, the truth of it for them, and to hear it as best I could through their voices and not through my experience. And I think through the course of this research, which you know spanned um, almost three years, that became something of an, an intellectual and spiritual practice for me, a kind of of really, you know, uh, uninvested listening practice. And I, I think now, you know, by the end of the project, I had a little bit of Stockholm syndrome. You know, I was <laughs> increasingly nunnish uh, myself, both in my religious practice and kind of my the way of looking at the world. And I thought that was kind of a good thing. But now that I'm at the end of that process, I'm really thinking about what does that that practice of listening mean in terms of how we engage and, and what does it mean to my faith, such, such it is, as it is, to be really attentive to others in the world in that way? Yeah, it's interesting how much you can be affected by the research that you do. Now, as far as these nuns are concerned, as we, as we mentioned, they're not part of a proper group or anything. And surprisingly, I think people will discover throughout the interview that many of them identify as being spiritual or, or even religious. Many of them have a religious background. Many of them borrow religious practices from the past or from other religious people. And what happens is some surveys about religiosity tend to privilege certain Christian identifiers as what counts as being religious. So it will find out how often people attend church, how often they read scripture, and how often they pray and things like that. That what you found is these things don't rank as high uh, on what people themselves report as being spiritually significant, even for people who are religiously affiliated. And this is where you began to discover religiosity amongst nuns. Yeah, I mean, and that kind of went way back, even, you know, when I was, you know, teaching in a seminary and I would say to people, what's spiritually significant to you? And we put it all on the blackboard or whatever, you know, among seminary students, you know, Eventually, 
prayer would come up, you know, never, you know, sometimes things about liturgy would come up, but really nobody ever said going to church or doing, you know, committee meetings um, with people or, or whatever, the, the, the institutional religious kinds of things really did not come up. And so I was aware of that. And when I started teaching at Santa Clara five years ago, teaching undergraduates in a Catholic university, a Jesuit university, about half of our students come from a Catholic background, but they're increasingly nunish themselves. In our religious studies classes, you know, probably 70% of our students identify as some kind of nun. And so when you ask those kids, you know, what's spiritually significant, it's nothing like anything religious that you've seen. You've seen. So I was aware that the measures that traditional demographic research was tracking really weren't tracking to people's experiences very closely. And so I talk about in the book, I had initially started to want to look at that. What does that mean about what religion is? What if we're looking at the wrong thing and, you know, and not paying attention to how people are really living their spiritual lives. And so I I did a test survey over a weekend, you know, because I'm not a demographer, I'm just a chick with a survey monkey account. (laughs) So I talked with a, a colleague and said, well, how do I do this? And she said, you know, just test it on if you get 100 people, it'll tell you something about whether you're asking the right questions or asking in the right way. And so I put it up over a weekend and sent it to a bunch of contacts and said, could you please send this out to people you know that I don't know probably. If some of them are religiously unaffiliated, that would be awesome. And I crossed my fingers and hoped I got 100, maybe 200 responses. And over the course of that weekend, I literally had to upgrade my SurveyMonkey account because I couldn't read the data I was getting. I got more than a thousand responses. Yeah. And they tracked pretty night, pretty closely to the breakdown of the Pew data with the 20%, 80%. And what I found that was that among that whole cohort, which, you know, 80% of which identified as religiously unaffiliated and because of the circles I travel in, even among people I, I don't know, a big chunk of that were clergy of the, among the affiliated. So among the whole group, the top five practices were spending time or enjoying time with family and friends, uh, with family, enjoying time with friends, preparing and sharing food, and enjoying time with pets and other animals. I refer to them as the four F's of contemporary spirituality, family, friends, Fido, and food. And the only traditional practice in there was prayer, which is, of course, the mobile technology of religion, right? It's one of the guys I I interview who's an atheist, uh, or or, yeah, says it's the one thing the church can't get his hands on, actually, he's spiritual but not religious, a Jesus follower. But he says it's the one thing the church can't get its hands on is prayer. So... You know, it was really clear that the shift in articulating of spirituality outside of institutional constructs was not just happening for nuns, but that nuns were marking it in the culture in a really big way. We'll we'll touch on all of those aspects in more detail as we go along. Today we're speaking with Elizabeth Drescher. She is at the Uh, Santa Clara University in California, and her new book is called Choosing Our Religion, The Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns. A minute ago, you mentioned different kinds of nuns, different types of nuns. So let's talk about those for a minute to kind of set up the rest of the discussion, because a lot of the people that you'll talk about identify differently, and few of them identify as nuns. So what type of types, I guess, uh, did you discover through your research of, of people that qualified as a nun, according to your research, but what were they calling themselves? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the the common thing, and I think the popular culture is to associate nuns with the spiritual, but not religious. And Pew Tract is a substantive group of people who do identify as spiritual, but not religious. Actually, both among the nuns and the people I come to call sums, the religiously affiliated stuff, some religion, you know, so among nuns, a substantial portion identify as spiritual but not religious, but nuns also include atheists, agnostics, um, and both hard and what are called hard and soft agnostics. Distinguish so, atheists and hard and soft agnosticism real quick. This yeah, is interesting. Yeah, so atheists, the, the, the question is settled. There, there is no supernatural being or power. They are um, oppo- you know, opposed to theism, so there's no theistic 
God or being, it, it's a settled question for them. It's just not a thing. For agnostics, there's still a possibility. The question is not as resolved. Hard agnostics tend to say the question, nobody can ultimately prove that there is or is not a God or a supernatural being or force. Nobody can ever really prove it, but I don't really think it's an important question either. I don't spend a lot of time stressing over that. Soft agnostics tend to be more engaged with the question of whether there is or a supernatural being or power and what that might be and how that might function. So they're, they're a little open, a little more open to the question. Along with that, there are a variety of kinds of humanists. So humanists, people who come out of the Enlightenment tradition of understanding life as oriented around human experience uh, and human reason, right? Some of them, of course, humanism is a Christian tradition, so they're inflected by that to lesser degree. Some of them identify as secular humanists, which really try to distinguish themselves from the Christian roots of humanism, um, so see themselves more in that worldly tradition of enlightenment humanists. Some just identify as secular, they don't even want the taint of humanism on there. And so those are all in the sort of non-believer categories, uh, atheist, agnostic, humanist, secular categories, non-theistic, not, not really belief-based. Then there are the spiritual, not, but not religious. Lots of people who identify just as spiritual. Uh, I talk about in the book that the history of the terminology of spiritual but not religious comes from the 12-step movement largely, and it's really a lot associated with baby boomers. So among younger adults, that has that, no, that's my mother kind of thing associated with it, and they tend to identify more as spiritual. Some identify just as none. They don't want to have any kind of label at all. But I will say, and I talk about this in the book, the idea of labeling is part of that baggage of how we do religion and how we market demographically. So for people across that spectrum, first of all, the labels changed all the time. You know, So they would start out saying, well, I'm agnostic, but I'm really spiritual, that there wasn't really language for describing who they were in the culture, but also that the labels themselves were heuristics, they were provisional, they were marking where they were at a moment, and people were really frustrated with this sense of having to have a durable label that would extend throughout a life and that was almost like an ethnicity or an ontological category. Across the board, people were really pretty uncomfortable with that. Yeah, that was one of the key distinguishing features, I think, that your book points out is this disaffiliation they they don't want to feel locked into this particular category and because they feel that's not particularly true to their own experience whether it be spiritual or you know whatever uh and, and they don't want to feel locked into those categories there seem to be very very concerned about how other people view them did, did you pick that up in the course of your research it seemed to be a lot about i don't want other people to see to to think of me in this way yeah, that happened in, in lots of ways. You know, among some people I, I interviewed, and this was like a big surprise. I went to, like, I was a speaker at a really big worship leader conference where I thought I'd find lots of Christian-y people. And I just happened upon lots of people who said, oh, no, I don't identify as Christian at all. You know, I see myself at best as a Jesus follower. And these, you know, Jesus followers, or, you know, whatever we might call them now, think of themselves as people who don't want to be tainted by the negative aspects of Christianity, uh, of Christianity, that they're politically conservative, that they're homophobic, sexist, you know, anti-evolutionary, anti-environmentalist, all of those kinds of things, close-minded, judgmental, actually the whole, you know, why don't they like us list. They don't want to be associated with that. So there was that variety, but there were also people on the other end of the spectrum who traditionally would have been identified as atheists who don't want to be involved in that argument either. You know, so I think for people who feel like if you put an identity on me that, that makes me seem to be on the strident extremes of religiosity, then I don't get to be human with you. And what I want is for us to be having a 
a human experience together. Yeah, don't pin me down kind of a thing. Um, yeah. Before we get into some of the specific stories of, of people that you uh, feature in the book, let's talk a little bit more about your method uh, of the project. So let's talk about how you went about identifying the nuns, uh, the categories that you came up with and, and finding them, the types of surveys you set up, and then maybe a little bit about some of the drawbacks of that research approach, which you address in the book as well. And I think it's mm -hmm. important to set it up that way so that people don't get the sense that this is the definitive book on all nuns or anything like that. So let's talk about your method and some of the caveats that you include. Well, you know, first of all, as I mentioned before, I, you know, I started out by trying to get my hands around the idea of what spirituality means today and what's spiritually significant for people. So early on, I did a bunch of focus groups here in California among some of my graduate students, but also in different religious groups. I did some in Pennsylvania and I did some online as well to try to get a sense of what are those categories of things that people find spiritually significant. So that was one set of background research that I did and then I developed that into the survey that I discussed earlier. I had, I had planned initially to repeat that survey, but I got so much data that was useful that I didn't really feel like I needed to. And more importantly, from that survey, I was able to identify a pool of people who identified as unaffiliated in various ways. And I was really interested in moving away from the coastal traditional nun zones to a wider view of the country. And so I'd made a commitment to interview people in all of the U.S. census regions. And so I, I pulled from that initial study to contact people who were in different, in different census regions across the country and ask if they'd like to participate in the study. And then I did a follow-up survey in which I, um, the Nuns Beyond the Numbers survey, that was a narrative survey with a few hundred people in which I asked people, it was kind of like an online journaling experience for people to respond to questions about their spiritual lives. And from that, I drew the interview uh, participants that I had. Where I didn't have a lot of people, I would, I would uh, in different, uh, in the Deep South, for example, I had a hard time finding people in, in like Georgia and Alabama, just not because there aren't nuns there, but because I don't know people there. Um, so I had to kind of shop around to find people to participate there. But I, I identified a pool of interview candidates and I tracked them to where I, I do a lot of speaking around the country, where I was traveling around the country for a couple of years. So that gave me access to people in different spaces. But one of the qualifications I make in the book is there are a couple of things, but, but one is so there are lots of people who identify as unaffiliated who are just religiously indifferent. And in fact, um, Pew came out with a, a, another slice of its 2014-2015 data last week in, in which they said, you know, increasingly people just don't even like to talk about religion. It's not just that they're not religious. They don't even want to have it be part of the conversation. So there's certainly not just a rising unaffiliation, but a rising indifference to religion. And those people had no interest in talking with me either. So to say that, so the people who were talking with me were interested in identify, identified themselves as having a spiritual life. So the people who just don't care and think that's a stupid conversation, lots of them did email me <laughs> uh, to tell me how stupid that conversation was. Um, stupid with two O's. Um, and, uh, you know, they're not part of the survey. So that's a whole other interesting pot of research to be done to look at what religious indifference looks like. Um, that's sort of upping the ante on that. So they're not in there. The other part of, of the other limitation on the survey was that I did focus on whatever people would call the spiritual life. I didn't define that for them. I didn't define spirituality for them. I let them define it. But it did mean that people were looking back over their lives and possibly identifying things as having spiritual meaning that they would not have seen at the time. And that always means that you're running the risk of kind of inventing spirituality. And that's certainly true. I was inviting people to construct their lives as spiritual and construct a narrative around it. So the benefit of that is, yeah, we all look back on our lives and 
we see things that if we're, we identify as spiritual people, we might identify in hindsight as spiritual, and that allows people to lift that up in, I think, interesting ways. But it is arguably the case, and I talk about this in the prayer chapter in particular, that there were some people who just said, nope, I don't pray, nothing like it, nothing approximates it, don't even use that category. And other people who did not initially call something prayer, but when I asked them if they prayed, reflected on their lives and said, well, you know, when I'm running, it's a kind of prayerful activity, but they wouldn't have lifted that up. Yeah, and so those caveats that you introduced, the way that the researcher impacts the thing being researched, um, you talk about the cohort that cohorts that are overlooked, including people who are irreligious or just even anti-religious or even anti-spiritual in any way. And also, um, demographically, people tended to be white, middle class, people with access to the sort of channels where you were asking the questions, going to a university event or using the internet in communities that would that would be connected to communities you're connected with. So I thought you did a good job of, of, um, of laying all those cards out on the table. Um, that's Elizabeth Drescher, and we're speaking with her today about her new book about the nuns choosing our religion. Now that we've kind of laid the groundwork about the type of people that you're working with for this book, we'll get a little bit more specific, and it gets more and more interesting as we go. Many of the nuns that you spoke with at least had some sort of religious background. Often they had been raised in a family with a primary religious tradition, or one of the parents had a primary religious tradition. Um, how they came to be nuns, their past experiences and so forth, uh, it was a really interesting part of the book. So let's talk about this. You separated into kind of three broad categories, and I wanted mm -hmm. to talk about those. Uh, let's start with mainline Protestant. They had a different experience about how they became a nun uh, and what being a nun was like than some of these others. So let's start there, mainline Protestant. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think of, you know, mainline Protestantism as sort of the, the center of the nun factory, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah in that um, we know that uh, mainline Protestants are producing nuns. People who are, who are raised in a mainline Protestant tradition are much more likely to become unaffiliated than people in other religious traditions. And I, I found too that whereas there's sort of this stereotype that has developed that nuns are angry, resentful, bitter, you know, anti-religious zealots who had some kind of horrible experience in their church. That was not largely the case with, with mainline Protestants. I mean, if I had, you know, a dollar for every every mainline Protestant who told me how wonderful their youth group experience was and how they, you know, they really enjoyed this, that, or the other of their, you know, their mission trip experience, I, I'd have a lovely vacation home on Carmel right now. <laughs> uh, you know, so, it, I mean, there was just a lot of, remembered enthusiasm for the church, but mainline Protestants, you know, I, I talk about just sort of got bored with it. They really outgrow it. They graduate from church. So it, it seems like for many mainline Protestants who become unaffiliated, they had a warm and loving experience in their church. They learned that they had to be thoughtful, loving, and ethical people, they're down with the golden rule, they don't need to hear it every week now, got it, check, I'm done, you know, and, you know, some of the uh, work that Chris Smith has done on moral therapeutic deism, you know, this idea that we just have to be good people, and we need to feel good about ourselves, and, and God is there if we need God, but, you know, like, we don't have to really get hung up on that. You know, that and just this sort of sense of, you know, where there was critique, it was more it was more about, I want to be more engaged in the world and doing spiritual work in the world. And that's not happening in church. But gosh, they're nice people. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a great time, you know. And it's interesting because you talk about how many of them express a fondness for their religious tradition that they grew up with. There's, there's not much of a sense of bitterness um, and that... Uh, the idea of graduation is sort of a way that they would talk about their experiences. Uh, and as far as mainline Protestant, just to be clear for people, we're speaking about people who are sort of Episcopal, I think would be one. What what other religious traditions do you um, put under that umbrella? Yeah, Episcopalian, Methodist, Presbyterian, UCC, United Church of Christ, Congregationalist. So what tends to be read in the culture now generally as the more progressive 
Protestant traditions. And this is interesting because some of the more conservative um, religious elements would, would look at this pattern of disaffiliation among people from these types of traditions and say, this is what happens when you water down the gospel. Uh, this is, you know, the fruits of being liberal is that you're going to trend uh, irreligious. But what you found with these people, and we'll talk about this more, uh, is that they maintained, uh, often would maintain a spiritual ethic and, and, and an engagement that that was a product of their earlier Christian affiliation. And it wasn't a sense of saying, well, I'm liberal now and I don't want Christianity. It, so it wasn't quite the same. And now the next group you talk about actually is people from the, those more conservative backgrounds and their experiences are quite different. Yeah, I mean, I um, people who, who came from, you know, broadband, Protestant evangelical, you know, more fundamentalist and more conservative traditions that would include, you know, Pentecostals, you know, some Mormons and non-denominational Protestants, as well as, you know, American Baptists or Southern Baptists. So people in that broad category, which is a big, big group of people, first of all, they were the only people in the book who regularly cussed. So <laughs> they were my cussing interviews. Um, they were often angry, um, really, really angry, and had felt, you know, tricked and betrayed by their traditions. Sometimes, you know, there were particular crises um, that happened in their religious communities. You know, in, in one case, there was um, financial fraud by a clergy person that really, for one of the people I interviewed, created an incredible sense of, of disillusionment. Um, and, and he remained connected to what seemed like pretty traditional evangelical Christian beliefs. He just was, you know, completely done with that experience and angry to the extent that he could see no way to identify with Christianity and with a church community ever again. For another of the, the people I identified, a young man who was part of a, a, a holiness Pentecostal tradition who had um, really smart guy, had been homeschooled, really great with tech, and on his way to go to college, encountered new information about evolution and Darwin, who had been kind of demonized in his tradition. And that opened up a whole world of exploration for him about things he had been taught about science and you know, climate change and evolution, all of these kinds of things. And he just felt he had been lied to and that there was a distortion of the truth. He was humiliated, you know, when he got to college and he believed the earth was 6,000 years old and there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark and all of those kinds of things. And he just felt like he was made to look like an idiot. And his religion was used to blind him intellectually. And so there's a lot of anger that comes out of that, one of the guys I interviewed who was raised as a Mormon just felt like he couldn't answer, ask questions about the world or ask questions about the tradition and get good answers from people. So there was a sort of frustration, deep, deep frustration among those nuns that often came out as extended anger in the tradition. I mean, one of the women I interviewed, you know, went through a horrible experience with her mother's church after she came out as a lesbian and, and she wanted to be supportive of look this is your tradition I get it it might help you and agreed to talk to the pastor who went through this sort of odd for her ritual and hostile ritual of praying over her and then slapping the devil out of her so physically just physically yeah, yeah. open hand slap so there was just a lot of, of anger um, yeah. in that in that cohort among my interviewees. It was, it's a really stark um, excerpt of the, uh, of the book when you described that, that woman's experience and it actually gave her, um, it's almost like a PTSD with, with regard to prayer. If she was in situations yeah. where prayer would be occurring, her mind would switch back to that. And I don't know if this is, is crass, but what it reminded me of is when you've eaten a meal and, and became ill afterward and uh -huh. you just don't want to eat that food anymore. And there's nothing, even if there could, you know, even if that food other people can eat and feel fine, but for you, you associate that experience going forward and that's hard to come back from. Yeah, I talk about it in the book as a haunting, yeah. you know, and she, I mean, she talked about Darnese, um, I call her in the book, 
um, she talked about, you know, prayer like sneaking up on her. And so there's just a predatory language of that. You know, this was this happened actually quite a lot in doing this research where I would just go back to my hotel room and, you know, just burst into tears <laughs> that, uh, you know, the, the tradition had done this to a person, you know, just really harm someone in this way. But she just really had the sense of, you know, sometimes I have the impulse to pray and then I go back to, you. I mean, I think the PTSD analogy is, is productive there, go back to this place. So yeah, just a lot of experiences that really create a sense of an inability to ever go back. You know, um, in Darnese's case, because her partner was involved in yoga and other kinds of things that were felt spiritual to her, she could reclaim a little bit of that, but in a very different way. Yeah, it couldn't be the same. And the the man that you mentioned uh, in the book, you call him Ethan Quinn, the the Mormon, uh, is forty five yeah. year old in Washington D.C. Uh, I think this really speaks to um, some of the anger that that people who leave the LDS tradition manifest, and it's similar to that evangelical who felt like. He had he had been told the earth was 6,000 years old and these types of things and wasn't encouraged to look into that. And when that evangelical fellow left his, ended up leaving his faith, it wasn't just that he was embarrassed. That was a part of it. He felt like, wow, I look like a real stooge um, believing the earth is 6,000 years old. But because the science that he learned was compelling to him, it wasn't just that he felt like, oh, boy, people think I'm dumb. It was, oh, and look at all this, look at all this amazing stuff that I missed out on. Uh but I want to talk about Ethan as well. So here's a quote from Ethan uh, from the book. He said, uh, religion dictated so much of my life as a child, not just what we believed, but really who we were against the rest of the world. He's describing an oppositional position vis-a-vis -vis the world. And uh, he said, uh, we were Mormons first. We were from five generations of Mormons, but I was always asking questions. Why do we do it this way? Why can't I drink a Coke? And my mom or dad would say, well, you just have to have faith. So I knew enough to shut up. And, um, you know, as a kid, I didn't really disagree exactly. I just wanted to know why. And I was always like that. So I asked questions about everything. But ask too much about the church, though. That seemed to be the worst uh, sin you could do. Um, and so that, that sort of shut down conversation later mm -hmm. manifests itself in, in anger with him. When he ended up disaffiliating, um, his reaction was much different than some of the mainline Protestants that you spoke with. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for Ethan and, and other folks on that part of the spectrum, there's just a sort of sense of, um, it's not just, I got new information. I mean, he does talk, and a lot of people talk about this, like I got to the library, you know, or I got like the internet, and wow, there's all kinds of information there. It's, it's not just the information, it's what certain perspectives on religious belief and practice due to relationships. So there's a, with the anger is a deep sense of interpersonal betrayal among the people who are meant to care the very most about us. So it's not a casual, um, you know, I think for mainliners, there's a sort of sense of, you know, ah, church doesn't work for me, but gosh, those people loved me. <laughs> you know, like they really supported, they didn't, you know, one of the women who, it now identifies as a neo-pagan, sort of, kind of, and a nun, a uh, spiritual nun, you know, said, I really love the prayer book, and, you know, they supported me as an artist, but they didn't get me, but, you know, they're really nice. Among uh, more conservative, people from more conservative Christian backgrounds that felt shut up, it, it breaks relationships. Yeah. And I think that's a big thing for religious communities to be thinking about. Yeah, the more stark the boundaries and the more pressure there is to conform, the, the more anger can be manifest on the other side of, uh, of, the, of the border, the boundaries, so to speak. So that's kind of your conservative background. But uh, Roman Catholicism is the third example. And, and I think I kind of expected it to go the same way as the conservative uh, folks, because um, it's a fairly conservative tradition as well, and has that sense of personhood, like you're a Catholic as an identity. But uh, a lot of the Catholics that you talked about had a little bit different of an, an experience, and I've also seen parallels to the Catholic uh, experience in in the Mormon tradition as well. So talk about the Catholic. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, and again, I, I do, you know, offer a, a you know, really 
strong caution against overgeneralizing yes. mm -hmm. this. I talked with 100 people. So that's a lot of people to interview, but it's not a big demographic sample. So we have to take some caution with that. But among Catholics, what I, what I saw a, a lot was heartbreak. Even where there was anger, people tended to come from a place of having, a, as you said, a deep, almost ethnic identification with the tradition. Um, and yeah, for, you know, for Ethan, the Mormon guy, when you come from, when you identify as coming from five generations of Mormons, that's not just your religion, right? That's your, your history. Yeah. That's who you are, right? And for Catholics, there was the same, you know, we know the tradition of Catholics in America has a lot to do with, you know, we, we, we came from a place of, you know, deep religious turmoil in some cases and to a place where we were going to be discriminated for many against for many generations as Catholics. Yeah, anti-Catholicism so Catholic, was, was very strong. Yeah, really a central kind of thing. So bonding around that identity was really important. But for people, you know, that being part of their, their community and their history, yeah, that mattered. But also the sacramental life of the church was really important to many people. One of the people that I, I interviewed, Natalie Darling, um, you know, still goes to a Taizé service um, for, you know, regularly has friends in the church, had considered becoming an NUN nun at one point, but felt just, again, betrayed and heartbroken when her, you know, bishops came out so strongly against marriage equality and the full inclusion of LGBT people in the church and the role of women in the, in under what she felt undermined the role of women in the church. So there was a sense of, I love this, but I, there's no place for me here. You know, and she talks about having been cast out, that she didn't, you know, she didn't leave. She was cast out of the tradition. Judith, the woman I, I talk about at the beginning of the, the church, you know, turn to the church in a, in a time of a horrible marriage crisis and got no support um, at all, um, was Divorce turned away. is pretty taboo in some Catholic circles. Right. And, you know, and just really found that, that she could not, you know, she could not find any support, you know, in the, in the face of an abu a very abusive relationship in that community. And another guy that I, I interview... Um, Frank, you know, talks about his church com community not being able to support his whole family that had a big identification with, with Catholicism. So all of these things, yeah, they have some of the elements of anger that I saw in more conservative traditions, nuns who came from more conservative traditions, but there was a sense of real loss, real sorrow, in some cases a sense of I wish I could find a place there, but I'm just not going to. It's not going to be a place for me. And it was sad. It was a really sad kind of thing. Yeah, there was a wounding that you talk about, wounding. And one other element that you talked about with Catholicism, and, and like you said, this can spread throughout any of these broad uh, generalizations, is that some of them would carry, still carry aspects of their tradition out with them. And I'm thinking in particular of the woman who, uh, <laughs> who you were speaking with who would put out pictures on her kitchen table. And she did not see the Catholicism in that until you kind of like said, oh, that kind of looks a little Catholic. Yeah, and even then she was like, no, <laughs> that's just, I'm not having that. Yeah, what was she doing? Yeah, she had this wonderful practice of in the morning, she had on her kitchen table a basket with pictures of her daughters and granddaughters. And she would sit down with a, a cup of tea, get the basket and just set out the, the pictures of her daughters and granddaughters and think about them, you know, and she'd said, I would just bring them to mind. I'm going to call this prayer. A priest wouldn't call it prayer because I, I'm not asking for God to do something for them that God, I don't want, you know, somebody else to not be helped because, you know, uh, somebody didn't pray for them. I'm calling this prayer. And so I said, wow, that looks like Catholic prayer cards. Um, and she said, no, it's nothing like that. Those are just things that nuns would give you in school, like trading cards, and they didn't really mean anything. This means something to me because these are real people in my life. And so, yeah, I would see that as certainly a pretty distinctly Catholic religious echo. But just because of the trauma of her experience in the class and in the church and that wounding that she experienced, she just couldn't 
own that as as coming from a Catholic tradition. Yeah, and those prayer cards never operated that way for her. So even though, uh, you know, she could, or, or you know, as far as we know anyway, yeah. that, that otherwise yeah. she would uh, see the connection there. So I, I really, a lot of these examples that we're kind of only touching on, there are a lot of them in the book uh, that I think uh, make the book an especially interesting read, even though, as you said, it only focuses on a relatively small group of people. So that kind of gives us a broad overview of some of the different types of Di disaffiliation patterns or the ways that people become none. Uh, and as we talked about earlier, um, the peer sur survey privileges as religious practice, things like church attendance and scripture study and things like this. You identified four common themes that you mentioned, family, friends, Fido, and food. I wanted to talk about family and friends in particular, because one of the biggest stereotypes about the nun experience, and this is one that I brought to the book myself, is that nuns must be very insular, uh, maybe narcissistic, uh, highly mm -hmm. individualistic. And you, you discovered this didn't actually describe the lives and experiences of a lot of the nuns you spoke to. And this quote really stuck out to me. You say, the unaffiliated indeed do affiliate, just not in the ways that would click a demographer's counter. Let's talk about relationships and the nuns. Yeah, so the early development of that idea of nuns as narcissistic and spiritually thin and all of those kinds of things comes from Robert Bella's work in Habits of the Heart and this idea of Sheilaism, which was this uh, woman who was a nurse, actually incredibly relationally engaged, who when Bella and his colleagues asked her what her religion was, she said, well, I kind of my own thing, it's Sheilaism. And that <laughs> became through the you know, 1980s and 90s a way of making fun of you know, what was then largely a spiritual but not religion, that everybody was doing their own idiosyncratic make up my own religion kind of thing. And and more recently, Lillian Daniel, who's a UCC pastor, wrote a thing for HuffPo that got a lot of traction on, you know, you're spiritual but not religious, don't bore me. And her idea was, you know, her thing was, yeah, I like a sunset too. I like walking on the beach, but community is complex and it demands things of us and you know what you're doing is self-absorbed and nar narcissistic and and you know I'd had my own experiences with people who had fairly idiosyncratic cobbled together spirituality so I, I brought a little bit of that into the book with me I didn't know how much Deepak Chopra I was going to be able to to <laughs> you know I was going to encounter and how much I'd be able to take um, you know but what I found was that people really centered what they found spiritually meaningful around relationships. And those relationships were mediated in lots of different ways. Sometimes that was through specific communities that gathered either formally or informally at different times. Sometimes it was around networks of authors or thinkers or teachers that people would engage, you know, informally, um, sometimes through the internet uh, in different ways. Uh, one of the guys, Neil, who's a, an atheist, connected with lots of other atheists through online sources. And that makes sense, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, more than that, 25 years ago, I guess, um, before, you know, we were all connected on the internet, if you were the atheist guy on the block, you might not find another one, right? Now you can find whole bunches of them. So those kinds of connections were happening. Um, but, you know, for one of the guys I profile in the book, Paul Harland, um, who had left an Episcopal church because his they were having all kinds of arguments about L LGBT inclusion, and he, he was just tired. And, and he said a thing that lots of people said. It was really hard to just get the energy together to get our kids to church. Like, that's a big, complex thing yep. you know like that takes a lot of juice and with all the bickering it just was like nah we don't need it anymore so he dialed out but he missed playing music with people at the church and so a bunch of friends some from church some not started coming together on a regular basis to you know to play music together they'd have a potluck one of the their friends had a big backyard and they they've been gathering together for years to do this so and and that he said was more deeply spiritual engaged him with his family in richer ways and with his friends all kinds of new ideas coming in and 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 different life changes for people that created a really rich experience so i think that 
what we're looking at when traditional, we look at traditional studies of religious practice is, is there a specific community with specific liturgical practices and a, and a built space where you spend a defined amount of time? And if, if you, we're going to count that as what's religious. And, you know, if you're gathering in some other way, that doesn't count. That just really doesn't count at all. Um, and nuns are saying, no, I'm counting that. When you ask me what's spiritual, that matters to me. And it can be these more formal things like, you know, Paul's jam band, but it can also be just um, encounters with people, pretty random encounters with people that, you know, one of the guys talked about hanging out, go going once in a while, um, his office was in Atlanta and he'd just go down to this busy courtyard on Peachtree Plaza and just sit there and kind of be with humanity. And that sense of connectedness helped him to ground the work he was doing, which he thought of as fairly abstract in the lives of real people, and to see that he was one of those people just moving through life. And it was a really rich experience for him. Now, there's another story in the book where your feelings of ambivalence come out a little stronger here. I'm thinking of Lourdes Alvarez. She's a 19-year-old uh, from Florida. She said she, you were asking her if she had a spiritual community, and she said, oh, yeah, I have this yoga class at school. Uh, <laughs> and you said this was both beautiful and worrisome. Yeah, well, so, you know, I, I was you know, talking to her about her spirituality. I said, do you have a spiritual, spiritual community? And she was like, oh, totally yoga. That is my community. And I thought, oh, this is going to be like she's been going to this yoga class three times a week for the, you know, the last couple years at least. And they hang out together. And of course, you know, because I come from a churchy background, I immediately build a church yeah, like yeah. around yoga class. But no, it's a class she started taking like that quarter. So she's been there, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 times, a couple times a week. She doesn't even know people's names. <laughs> You know, and that's her community, I, she says, yeah, but that's her community. <laughs> and I was like, wow, how is that your community? Like, and I'm, you know, and I went to, well, like, what would you do for people there? And, and she said, well, they're, you know, they're like, you know, they're people I know from yoga. And I said, so do you help them from, you know, cause you're there and she's like, well, I might think about them or if they're having a bad day, I might say, Hey, cheer up. And she so, might give them a ride. She said, I think. Yeah, I might give them a ride because I have a car yeah. and other people don't have a car and, you know, and I see them out and I think, hey, that's so-and-so from yoga class or guy from yoga class. I don't even know his name. And I thought, well, how is that spiritually meaningful? Because it does seem so, so thin. I, you know, I, I asked her, I said, well, you know, would you, you know, you'd give somebody a ride, would you give them a kidney, you know? <laughs> Um, and she was like, well, no, probably not, but maybe I would, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of go to, well, like sometimes being in a community requires that you give a kidney, you know, like sometimes it's consequential. So that was the sort of worrisome side of it for me. Like how do we sustain the social good that religious communities along with other communities create in the world? And that's a real and substantial thing. Um, the other part of it, though, was this sort of lovely, and I talk about the shift from communitarianism to cosmopolitanism that I think is marked by the nunning of America. This sort of sense of community, as, as Lourdes was defining it, as being a sense of being in relationship with people where you are and honoring that connection so that, you know, later that day I talk about in the book, I had to go pick up a prescription. And having had that conversation with Lourdes just made me plug in to standing at the pharmacy with these people who were having actual lives, you know, a woman with a kid who was sneezing and I can be very germ phobic and normally I just want to get away from that. But I all of a sudden had this sort of tenderness toward here's this woman trying to wrangle these kids in this line and it, people are sneezing and there's a guy with a Der Wiener schnitzel uniform <laughs> on, you know, getting ready to go to work and checking his watch. And what, so there's something lovely, I think, about really embracing the spiritual in our relatedness with people, even if that's not a sustained 
adorable relatedness in the sense of that being institutionalized. And of course, in the Christian tradition, you know, Christians talk about seeing the face of Jesus in people. But I, I really came to see that as no, seeing people as they are in that moment, and maybe that aggregates into something that has the kind of social good that we traditionally associate with religious communities. That's Elizabeth Drescher. She's an adjunct associate professor of religious studies at Santa Clara University, and she's written on American spirituality in, in a number of different periodicals like America, Salon, uh, Sojourners, and in the Washington Post and the Huffington Post. And she also wrote a book, Tweet If You Heart Jesus, and her latest book, Choosing Our Religion, is what we're talking about today. When we come back on the other side of the break, we'll talk about the golden rule and how Elizabeth challenges it in the book a little bit and how nuns have found different ways to approach the golden rule. Sam Brown was a teenaged atheist struggling to get firmer footing. On an August Sunday morning in 1990, he found himself sitting at the sacrament table in an LDS chapel next to his brother and two close friends preparing to utter a prayer over the water. What brought him back? How did he go on to write a sympathetic, scholarly book on Joseph Smith and early Mormon theology? And how did his research shape his faith? Find out in the Maxwell Institute's new book, First Principles and Ordinances, The Fourth Article of Faith in Light of the Temple. Sam Brown's book is in the Institute's Living Faith series, books aimed at spiritual and intellectual inspiration. You can find First Principles and Ordinances by Samuel M. Brown at maxwellinstitute.byu.edu or on amazon.com. I'm back with Elizabeth Drescher. She's the author of Choosing Our Religion, The Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns. It's a brand new book that just came out about surprising aspects of the spiritual life of Americans who don't affiliate with particular religious traditions. Elizabeth, one of the common things that people who are affiliated talk about when they think about nuns is that nuns must lack a moral compass. Uh, if they don't believe in God, anything goes. And this happens for people family members who see one of their family members depart the faith or something, what are they going to believe? Do they have any kind of beliefs? They must just think anything goes. Um, what, what, how do different nuns confront that, uh, that perspective? Yeah, I mean, that came up for me because I was doing a lot of speaking with religious groups as I was researching and writing the book. And so, you know, the affiliated Psalms would, would ask me all the time, you know, well, what are they going to, how are they going to make moral decisions? How are they going to ground that? So that was one aspect of it is can you be uh, moral? Can you be good without God? You know, without the guidance of a, a divine law or rule and a, and a moral community to norm that. So that was one thing. Um, the other part of it was whether it's morally wrong to teach children, so the children of nuns, that there's no afterlife, you know, that when grandma dies, that's it, she's gone. And there, there's no hope of ever encountering her in any, in any way again. Um, and that that was cruel. And that the wonder of the world is a is a bigger wonder when it's associated with a supernatural being and power. So there were lots of layers of that. Um, but the idea that that nuns, you know, somebody said, like, my mother thinks I'm going to go out and boost a car if I can, you know, um, because I, I don't go to church anymore. The idea that nuns have no ethics is is pretty common or a confusion about where they would where they would get them right right because yeah christian and tradition so, has a long history of sort of grounding morals in in an ontological argument about what god is and what what you know what nature is and all these things and so people think if you remove that the funny thing is is i, I think a lot of christians don't even really reflect on that or couldn't sit down and pass a theology test if they had to but 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 there's got to be something else then that that sort of informs an ethic yeah, and you know, nuns themselves um, wrestled with that. I mean, I talked about one couple, Benjamin and Kate, who had decided, you know, like I think literally the 15 minutes before, um, you know, Kate was about to give birth to their twin daughters, yeah. <laughs> that they weren't going to baptize them, they weren't going to raise them in the, in the church. Um, and that had all kinds of implications for their families. But then they had to think about, well, then how do we raise them to be good people? And that set out for them a really important moral exploration. So first of all, 
you know, Kate um, did a whole bunch of, of reading on different approaches to morality that, that came out of the humanist tradition and the atheist tradition. And they found that that was helpful, but it didn't, it, you know, they felt like that was too strident, you know, that they wanted their daughters to explore and be curious about the world. So then they started talking with their family and friends about what their values were and really thinking about where they got those values and, and, and developing what they felt like were a set of values about being curious about other traditions, about the way people live in the world and being oriented in toward improving the world with your life. So I think for lots of nuns themselves who have been raised in a religious tradition and they learned the Ten Commandments or they learned, you know, the five pillars or, or whatever they, you know, was the, was the uh, rule-based structure of their religion and the sense that there's some kind of divine being or force that's going to enforce that, they really had to stop and think about it. But that thinking in itself became a powerful moral and spiritual practice for them. Um, the idea that we negotiate morality in relationship with each other, that becomes an important kind of thing. And I talk about in the books overall, not just in the, in the discussion I had with, discussions I had with people about morality and ethics, that there's a relationship-based, a care ethics approach that's really grounded in our primary relationships with family and how do we how do we nurture and develop people in the context of family and then how do we extend that into the world so what i saw overall was was nuns articulating an ethics of care that says how do we live with one another in what Buddhists would say right relationship right how do we develop relations of relationships of nurturing and care in the world what are the values that sustain that and the practices that sustain that so it wasn't about not having a moral compass but and not being moral relativists either but about thinking about morals and ethics as something as sustained in relationship negotiated in relationship and normed in practice the book made it pretty clear that couple of the biggest bits, the fact the idea that nuns are atheists or the idea that nuns uh, are utter moral relativists, you do a, a fine job of, of overturning those perspectives. Let's talk about the golden rule Christians, the people that you talk about who uh, a lot of people, um, Christian, non-Christian, will talk about do unto others as others would do unto you. It's simple moral principle, but your book explores some of the problems that nuns have come to see with that ethic or some of the problems that you began to uncover as you spoke with them about that ethic? Yeah, I mean, people people generally, you know, love the golden rule in lots of ways, both believers and non-believers, the, the affiliated and the unaffiliated. So um, there's a researcher at Boston University, Nancy Ammerman. Um, so Ammerman did a study a decade or so ago about what she called golden rule Christians. And what she found was that in a, in a wide range of Christian communities, both conservative and liberal, when she asked people what's the main teaching of Christianity, they would say the golden rule from Matthew, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, and what Ammerman found was that the golden rule does a really great job of focusing people on caring for people who are most like them. And, and that's because the golden rule locates the standard for care on you, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So uh, it's reciprocal. It's first of all, it locates it in, in the person doing the caring. So I'm the standard for what you would want. And also, there's an expectation of kind of a cosmic reciprocity. Eventually, that will that will come back to me. So, then there are two problems with that. One is what I might want might not be what you need, and that causes me to look for people who are like me to offer care, and that narrows the circle of care. It makes it hard for me to reach out to people whose needs aren't like mine, and so I can't match them to them. And then this expectation that there's going to be some kind of general reciprocity, that somebody else will also be looking for somebody like them, and I'll be that person, and I'll be cared for. That tends to narrow the circle of care Ammerman found and prevent 
Christian communities from reaching out in really radically loving ways to people who are way other. And nuns like the golden rule as well, I found, because the golden rule exists in lots of other forms in lots of other traditions. Even in the Christian tradition, it doesn't reference God. So it's an atheistic rule. And so it seems like, okay, this is good. We just care for each other the way we want. The problem people have had philosophically with that is this inability to, to engage the other. And many, many of the nuns I talk, talked with noticed that too. And lots of them saw the story of the Good Samaritan from scripture as a corrective to that, as a moral corrective that said, no, the, the Good Samaritan was, was good precisely because he was not expected to tend to the man who is left beaten on the side of the road because that, that person was not like him at all and had was damaged goods from a Samaritan perspective. And so that reaching out to the other, the kind of cosmopolitan spirituality that says we care for people on the basis of what we need, whether or not we're gonna get something back from that. That's a very different mode of ethics that doesn't require inventing a whole new religious tradition, but is compelling to lots of nuns because I think they see themselves as othered within religious communities yeah. and they still wanna be engaged. And also because they wanna see the world in its rich cosmopolitan diversity. Yeah, it's really interesting yeah. that reciprocity versus relationality and some of the nuns would even talk about um, how they, in their religious former lives, if they had them, they were sometimes motivated by fear of punishment or by a desire for a reward, in, whether it be going to heaven or whatever else. And that these types of rules rules-based and reward punishment moral and ethical outlooks they saw as not as compelling as their new outlook which was based on a new ethic of just caring for humanity and that this is inherent to humanity whether it evolved or whether it it just happens to be they they may not have like a garden of eden story for it uh, but they do right. have an ethical system uh, that informs their spirituality it's a it's a really valuable part of what your book does and i also liked how you demonstrated the ways that some religious traditions that this isn't countering some of the things that you can find within religious affiliated communities as well it's just that some communities emphasize certain things and and don't emphasize other things so yeah i mean i think the only thing i would add to that is that because nuns are nuns because of their diffuseness and their diversity and their variability even within their own identity and, and practice there's not a you know, I was able to look at their stories as they as they told them to me and their practices and say, I'm really seeing what looks like a care ethics. So that's a system I overlaid on their practice. I'm seeing a sense of a good Samaritan cosmopolitan ethical practice that's really important. But one of the things I say at the end of the book is where I think religious communities and the unaffiliated can come together productively for the good of the world is that religious communities are really good at systematizing, at articulate, at creating, you know, durable narrative arcs. Can we be too rigid about that? Yeah, sure. Data shows that very clearly, but that doesn't mean we throw that away. And I think that if we're all concerned with improving the world, whether that's the world we live in now or the world in, we live in now as it becomes the world to come, whatever kingdom means to people at different times and in different ways, um, I think that conversation about how can we all bring our gifts to the table, I think that's really important. That's Elizabeth Drescher. She's an adjunct associate professor of religious studies at Santa Clara University. She joined us today on Skype from California. We talked about her book, Choosing Our Religion, The Spiritual Lives of America's Nuns. It's a brand new book from Oxford University Press. Elizabeth, thanks so much for taking your time to do the interview today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure.